We're going to spend some time this morning talking about the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and the Florida Keys Eco Discovery Center. Now, the Marine Sanctuary was established in 1990 to protect the spectacular marine ecosystem that we have here in the Keys. One of the many reasons why this is so important is because millions of tourists that come to the Keys every year, and a majority of those tourists, they're wanting to spend time seeing fish, catching fish, and just being out on the water. As you know, that greatly contributes to our economy right here in Monroe County. Carrie, thank you for being here with me this morning. Thank you, Jenna. Mm -hmm. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. All right, Carrie, let's have you start by telling us what exactly the National Marine Sanctuary is. Yes, well, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is one of 13 national marine sanctuaries around the United States. Uh, and ours protects basically the entire waters of the Florida Keys. We were designated, as you mentioned, in 1990 to protect the marine ecosystem. And as soon as you step foot in the waters, you put your big toe in the waters on the beach, you giant stride off a dive boat, you're entering a very special place, the marine sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And it extends all the way from uh, just south of Miami, all the way out through the Dry Tortugas on both the Gulf and the Atlantic sides. Wow. Okay. Now, Carrie, what areas are all protected with the marine sanctuary? Well, we protect everything from the mangrove fringe shorelines of the thousands of islands that we have here in the Keys, all the way out through the seagrass meadows, the lush seagrass meadows, and we actually have some of the world's largest and most contiguous seagrass meadows, and then out to the barrier reef. Um, the Florida Keys are home to the world's third largest barrier reef, mm -hmm. which, um, as you mentioned, is the reason we have the economy that we, we do today. The health of the reef and that entire ecosystem uh, is directly tied to the health of the economy. Right, and why is it so important, Carrie, to be protecting all of these areas? Besides just, of course, the economy, like we've mentioned now twice. Well, um, if people like to eat fish, if they like to catch fish, the fish that we have here mm -hmm. um, are due to the reef ecosystem. The snappers and groupers and hogfish, those are reef fish. And so um, coral reef, the coral reef habitat, um, provides a home for them. Reefs are important around the world, and more than 25% of the world's fish, fish spend some time in their life at the reef. Um, and the reef kind of steals the show. Everybody wants to see the coral reef, right. but it's also important to mention the seagrass and the mangroves and the role they play, because seagrass and mangroves are actually nursery habitat for different species. Mm -hmm. uh, seagrass is very important to, um, to protected species like queen conch, um, sea turtles, mm -hmm. manatees, dolphins. Um, a lot of different marine life that we like to see spend some part of their time often in the seagrass or reef or mangrove and they'll kind of move through those different habitat types. So it's really that that's their home. This is mm -hmm. where they live, it's where they thrive, it's where they need to be healthy and that's why we protect all of those habitat types and the seafloor itself. Mm -hmm. Now Carrie, what would you say are some of the most common misconceptions about the National Marine Sanctuary? Well, um, a lot of people think that the sanctuary only is, is only these small zones. Mm -hmm. uh, the sanctuary uses a strategy called marine zoning. And much like we have different zones on land, like we have parks and residential zones and commercial zones and things like that, so too can the ocean actually be zoned for different uses. Mm -hmm. And we have 18 small areas that we call sanctuary preservation areas. And a lot of people think that those are the sanctuary, that that's, that's the only part of the sanctuary are these tiny zones. Mm -hmm. But it's actually, as I mentioned, all the waters. And so within this zoning type, we have these small areas which are no take or no fishing. And those preservation areas were set aside at those really busy reef spots um, so that we could avoid user conflict, so that we didn't have divers with you know, trawls going over on top of them. And that represents a very, very tiny portion of the sanctuary. About 95% of the sanctuary is actually open to fishing and consumptive use. So um, we have those sanctuary preservation areas, which is where most people think of the sanctuary because they think of no take. Wow. But we're actually much, much bigger, 2,900 square nautical miles to be exact. Wow, so literally when you step into water, you're in the sanctuary. A special place mm -hmm. where all coral is protected and mm -hmm. all coral, hard and soft coral, has been federally protected here uh, since 1997. And that's really important because you can go other places in the world and you could tap dance on the reef if you wanted and mm -hmm. there aren't any protections in place. But we recognize that value, and um, so we have, you know, no touching, no taking, no breaking, you know, no injuring of any sort. Mm -hmm. But you know, the unfortunate reality is that things like boat groundings happen, where right. people might not be familiar with the waters, and they'll run their boat aground on coral, 
well, because we have these protections in place, we actually have mechanisms where we can um, cite them, give them fines or penalties for doing that, and then use that money for restoration. So we actually have biologists that, get, that can go out and restore the reef in the wake of a vessel grounding. Okay, and now what can people here do to make sure that this stays protected, along with following the rules? What else can they do? Yes, well, everyone can be kind of a, a sanctuary or coral reef crusader. Mm -hmm. um, some easy things they can do are participate in shoreline or beach cleanups. Mm -hmm. Basically, make sure that you recycle um, as much as you possibly can. Um, dispose of things properly, and that goes for both physical trash and things like, um, you know, motor oil. And, you know, we, we don't want to think of people pouring things down the drain, but, you know, the unfortunate reality is that it does. Mm -hmm. um, you know, be careful of what's in your driveway because it'll end up in the street, and everything that ends up in the streets ends up as stormwater into our ocean. Um, we obviously ask that people abide by fishing regulations and mm -hmm. sanctuary regulations and um, basically learn as much as you can about the coral reef environment and share that information with others. Mm -hmm. And we also ask um, if you are out on the water, please use a chart. If you're unfamiliar with the waters, if you're renting a boat, um, you know, stay within marked channels. We ask people to remember the jingle, brown, brown, run aground, white, white, you just might, blue, blue, sail on through. <laughs> and, uh, you know, catchy. <laughs> yes, so definitely practice responsible boating, practice mm -hmm. responsible diving. Mm -hmm. um, mind your fins and hands when you're out there snorkeling. Mm -hmm. If you need to adjust your gear and you're not comfortable, don't, you know, stand on top of the reef to adjust your mask, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well, any more information on that, Carrie? Thank you for sharing all of that. Check out the website that you see on the bottom of the screen or give the phone number that you see a call. I'm going to be right back after these messages. We'll focus on the Eco Discovery Center. Stay with me.